Thank you. That concludes general questions. And before we move on to First Minister's questions, I invite members to join me in welcoming to the gallery His Excellency Marcus Leitner, Ambassador of Switzerland to the United Kingdom. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. And at question number one, I call Douglas Ross. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This time last year, there were 648 patients in Scotland's <clears throat> NHS who had waited more than two years for treatment. First Minister, how many people are now enduring this long wait? First Minister. Uh, there are more people now waiting for NHS treatment. Uh, that will be the case uh, for uh, those waiting the longest period of time, including over a year and over two years. That is why our NHS recovery plan is so important, which is to improve waiting times uh, generally, but also to ensure that health boards are targeting those who are waiting uh, longest. As we know, indeed, as the Health Secretary has just been narrating to the Chamber, before the pandemic, we were seeing progress in reducing waiting times, given the pressures at that time that were on the National Health Service. Um, the pandemic obviously had a significant impact, but in terms of the statistics published uh, most recently, uh, we are starting to see uh, tentative signs of improvement as a result of the actions that we are seeing. So in the most recent quarter, for example, we saw an increasing number of first outpatient appointments uh, and we saw a slight reduction in those waiting over 12 weeks. Uh, similarly, with the treatment time guarantee, uh, we saw an increasing number of patients seen. Uh, so this is challenging uh, for the National Health Service. It can't be otherwise, given the impact of a, a two-year pandemic, which is still uh, making its presence felt. Uh, but the government is supporting health boards uh, to ensure that that recovery happens. Uh, and as part of that, that those waiting uh, the longest uh, for treatment are seen as quickly as possible. Douglas Ross. The question was straightforward. There were 648 patients last year waiting longer than two years for treatment. Mm -hmm. What is it now? The answer the First Minister couldn't or wouldn't give is 10,613 people in Scotland who have waited more than two years for treatment in our NHS. The First Minister was speaking about tentative improvements. That is a 16-fold increase in a year. This isn't the NHS recovery her government promised. Things are getting worse, far worse, mm -hmm. not better, First Minister. Now we're hearing of heart patients being given appointments two years down the line. Reports today state people are receiving appointment dates in July 2024. First Minister, is that acceptable? First Minister. Um, in terms of the particular case uh, cited in the media today, no, I don't think that is acceptable. And I know that a review of that particular appointment, uh, which is a follow-up outpatient appointment, not a first outpatient appointment, is being undertaken in contact uh, with the patient will be made. Um, it is the case uh, that waiting times generally and those uh, waiting an unacceptably long time for treatment has increased over the past year. I'm afraid that is the impact of a global pandemic. Uh, we have over the past year uh, seen further waves of COVID that has uh, had a big impact on the number of treatments that can be done in our National Health Service as infection control measures uh, have had to be tightened up and of course as a number of staff have themselves had COVID and been off sick. Uh, that uh, is an impact that countries across the UK, countries across Europe and the world uh, are finding uh, themselves uh, at the moment. Uh, that is why we are investing so heavily. We have record numbers of staff working in our National Health Service, up uh, considerably just in the last year and up by almost 30,000 since this government took office. And it's why we are investing specifically in the recovery plan. And while these are tentative signs, it is encouraging that we are starting to see some of the improvements uh, that I narrated in my earlier answer. Um, and while I am responsible, uh, as is the Health Secretary in the Government for NHS Scotland, uh, it is the case that in very challenging uh, circumstances, whether we look at A&E or waiting times 
uh, more generally. Uh, we see through the efforts of staff in NHS Scotland uh, the work that is being done. Uh, so, for example, in Scotland, uh, per 1,000 of the population, uh, there are 101 patients uh, waiting. These are the most recent statistics. Uh, in England, that's 112 per 1,000, uh, and in Wales, 200. In 21. That does not excuse uh, the performance in Scotland. Uh, we have a responsibility to tackle that, and that is exactly what we are doing. Dr. Cross. The First Minister says things are encouraging. How encouraging must it be for that heart patient to get a letter telling her to wait another two years to be seen? And as expected, that the First Minister speaks about the pandemic. I have a constituent in Lossy who has been waiting four and a half years from first being seen by his doctor to getting the operation he needs. Four and a half years is far longer than the pandemic. In fact, it's pretty much an entire parliamentary term. And the longer and longer waiting times are a problem across every area of Scotland's NHS. Twice as many Scots are waiting over three months for key diagnostic tests compared to last year. Mm -hmm. This morning, the president of the Royal College of Radiology, Jeanette Dixon, said for every four-week delay to diagnosis of cancer, your risk of dying increases by 10 per cent. First Minister, these are her words. So people are deteriorating. Cancers are growing. Sometimes they are becoming incurable. More often, patients are having to have more devastating treatment, treatment with bigger side effects that has a bigger impact on their quality of life for the same outcome. First Minister, if our NHS is currently in this position, how bad is it going to be by winter when so many more people need treatment? And will you act now instead of waiting for the crisis to strike like you did last year? First Minister. That, that's not what we did last year. What happened last year is that we had further waves of the COVID pandemic, yeah. uh, similar to countries across uh, the world. Uh, and of course, I'm going to mention the pandemic. There is not a health service uh, literally on the face of the planet that has not had to deal with the impacts of a pandemic. And I think uh, anybody uh, looking at this reasonably understands that. Uh, before the pandemic, uh, we were uh, seeing progress. So, for example, before the pandemic, the number of outpatients waiting for a first appointment had reduced by more than 20 per cent. Over the same period, the numbers waiting over 12 weeks uh, had fallen by more than 30 uh, per cent. We were seeing an increase in the number of inpatient and day case uh, treatments carried out. Uh, the pandemic clearly it had an impact. At the start of the pandemic, uh, we paused all but the most urgent treatments on the National Health Service. So the health service here, as in other countries, is having to recover and catch up. And that is what it is doing. And we are starting to see some tentative signs of progress. And we will continue to support uh, the National Health Service. On the Royal College of Radiologists report, which is an important piece of work, let me first of all uh, set some context, presiding officer, because this is important. Uh, since this government took office, there has been a 95 per cent increase in the consultant oncologist workforce. There has been a 63 per cent increase in the consultant radiologist workforce. As the report acknowledges, recruitment within these professions is challenging nationally and globally, made more challenging by Brexit, it has to be said. Uh, but we're working with health boards on new approaches to maximise the capacity. And as the Royal College report also says, uh, the increasing use of imaging networks in Scotland is going from strength to strength. So these are challenges that are inescapable, given what we've lived through in these past two years. But this government continues to get on with supporting the National Health Service to recover and to deliver for patients. Douglas Ross. The First Minister doesn't like opposition politicians stating that the COVID pandemic can't be blamed for everything. Therefore, will she listen to the President of the Royal College of Radiology, Jeanette Dixon, this morning again said this, it's not the pandemic that has caused the shortage. The pandemic has laid bare the shortages that were there before. It's also exasperated the shortage as well because of diagnostic backlogs. That is from clinicians who are speaking to the government right now, saying don't use these excuses. It is clearly problems that have been built up for years and years. Now, last winter, we saw the NHS battle from crisis to crisis. Our ambulance service and A&E department struggled so much with patient demand that our United Kingdom armed forces had to step in. This year, we're not even close to winter 
and the situation is far worse. Scottish patients are being sent to England for treatment that they can't get here. Well, the First Minister looks puzzled. We've spoken to Alan Turner, a 70-year-old from Kelso. He was referred for knee replacement in October. He was told he would have to wait up to three years to get that knee replacement on the NHS in Scotland. Or he could go to England for private treatment paid by Scotland's NHS. He reluctantly agreed to travel south and he was successfully operated on. Then, when he returned to Scotland, he tried to get essential aftercare and physiotherapy locally and he was told he couldn't for months. Alan is now back to square one. Mm -hmm. He can't even bend his knee. He'll need to endure the painful wait for treatment all over again. So while it's welcome that we can rely on services across our United Kingdom in times of need, First Minister, should people like Alan really need to go to England for treatment in the first place? First Minister. Miss, obviously, I'm happy to look into individual cases, but in general terms, that's a mischaracterisation of the position. Um, and I'd point, out, I'd point out to Douglas Ross again that while um, I don't shy away from the challenges in NHS Scotland, which are my... Uh, responsibility. Waiting times are worse in England than they are in Scotland. Accident and emergency uh, waiting times are worse in England than they are in Scotland. Our accident and emergency departments that were mentioned uh, by Douglas Ross uh, are the best performing anywhere in the UK, uh, although performance needs to improve. But let me, let me come to the specific point that Douglas Ross, this was not somebody, certainly from the information that Douglas Ross has shared, I'm happy to look at any more information that is available. Uh, when uh, someone is waiting on the NHS um, and are waiting uh, too long for treatment, if it is possible for NHS Scotland at NHS Scotland expense to access uh, treatment in the independent sector, it will do that in the interests of the patient. Um, sometimes, uh, and there are uh, agreements in place between Scotland and other parts of the UK for more specialist treatment, and they work in both directions. Um, but in terms of standard, it, th this patient, from what Douglas Ross has said, hasn't gone to NHS England yeah. for treatment. Uh, we have paid for treatment Absolutely. in the independent sector, yeah. so they are treated more quickly yeah. uh, than they would be otherwise. That is what happens. While we continue to invest in the improvement of waiting times on a, a, a NHS Scotland. Uh, so we will continue to address these challenges. We will continue to invest. We will continue to support record numbers of staff in our National Health Service uh, and get on with that job. Thank you. Question number two, Anna Sarwar. Officer, when Nicola Sturgeon became First Minister, 6,200 children and young people were on a mental health treatment waiting list. 25 per cent were waiting over the target of 18 weeks and 221 have been waiting over a year. That now, number is now over 10,000 on a waiting list, 44 per cent waiting over 18 weeks and over 1,300 waiting over a year. These failures have consequences, and here's just one. A mother contacted me about her son. He was diagnosed with autism 10 months ago, but was told he would have to wait to see a psychiatrist before medication could be prescribed. He's still waiting. In that time, his condition has become worse, and he's begging for the medication, in his words, to sort out my head. He is eight years old. First Minister, why does an eight-year-old have to suffer with no support for almost a year. First Minister. Uh, they, they, they shouldn't, um, and uh, I am not going to say that that is acceptable. Uh, but again, in mental health treatment, as in the NHS more generally, uh, we are investing in order to support health boards deliver the treatment, catch up with the impact of the pandemic. So again, uh, we are seeing uh, signs of improvement. If I can uh, again cite uh, the most recent statistics that were, uh, of course, published just this week. In the most uh, recent quarter, uh, we saw the highest ever recorded number of children and young people starting treatment in CAMS uh, services. That was 7.7 per cent up from the previous uh, quarter and a 20 per cent increase from the same quarter in the last year. Uh, we also saw an increase in the number of CAMS patients starting treatment within 18 weeks of referral. There is still considerable work to do, but the investment we are making, the reforms that we are making within mental health uh, treatment services are starting to deliver 
um, that improvement. Uh, we have also increased investment. So if you look at expenditure specifically on CAMS since 2019-20, uh, we have increased that by almost £80 million. Uh, that is, uh, I think, a 14% uh, increase. Uh, overall, mental health expenditure um, has uh, risen by almost uh, 9%. Uh, so these are tough challenges. Nobody says otherwise. Uh, we cannot magic away, uh, as much as we would all love to, the impact of a pandemic. Uh, but we are supporting the health service to recover from the pandemic and to see uh, more patients more quickly. And that work will continue uh, with the focus it needs and deserves. Anna Sarwa. As much as the, the First Minister might want to try and blame the pandemic, she can't blame the pandemic for this one. Uh, this happened before COVID. And let me give her the stats. Between November 2014 and March 2020, waiting lists increased by over 5,000. The numbers waiting over 18 weeks more than trebled, and those waiting over a year increased from just over 200 to nearly 1,000 before COVID-19. But these statistics don't show how broken this system is. I was contacted by another mother whose son was seen after waiting 18 months. His treatment made a difference but ended in June last year. But his condition started to deteriorate by August, and he was put back on a waiting list. And despite reporting suicidal thoughts, he is still waiting 11 months on. After waiting months already, why does a 14-year-old who has been referred, who has been seen, and who is now reporting suicidal thoughts, have to start from the beginning again? First Minister. I am not going to comment on individual cases. I am, of course, always happy to look at individual cases if uh, these are sent to me. Uh, but in terms of the treatment that young people uh, are entitled to expect uh, when they come forward to CAM services, one of the other things that has been done in recent times is the publication of the National CAMS Service Specification, which sets out clearly levels of service. That's backed uh, by £40 million of additional investment. Um, and we are investing in more staff, but also, of course, reforming the way mental health services for young people work. Where people need, young people need specialist services, uh, they should be available, which is why the improvements uh, that I have uh, talked about in my earlier answer don't go far enough but are uh, important. Uh, it is also the case that we are trying uh, to build up and are building up more community-based services so that fewer young people need to be referred to specialist services. So, uh, for example, we have employed or supported the employment of counsellors in all secondary schools uh, to support young people on an early intervention basis. So we will continue uh, to take the steps to invest in mental health services, uh, but also to reform mental health services so that they become more preventive um, and operate on a, an earlier intervention basis. The final point I would make, because Anna Sarwar is right, uh, because you know, I've stood here on many occasions and talked about these issues, that mental health in particular, we were seeing significant challenges before the pandemic, which is why much of the investment I have talked about it has been happening. Partly this is because uh, that more and more people, as the stigma of mental health reduces, more and more young people are coming forward for help. That is something we should encourage and be positive about, but it makes it all the more important that the investments and the reforms that I am talking about today here happen and continue. And that's exactly what the case will be. Anna Sarwa. Two cases I've cited are not individual cases. They are a demonstrative of a wider systemic problem. And if mental health services are going to be taken seriously, we need reform of the referral and triage system. We need a mental health professional in every GP practice. And young people in every primary and secondary school need to have access to face-to-face -face mental health services. These are solutions. But all the First Minister has done again today is offer year after year his warm words. In 2015, Nicola Sturgeon said waiting times were too long. In 2016, she said there were far too many children whose needs were unmet. In 2017, she said, long waits are unacceptable. In 2018, she said, there is more work to do. In 2019, she again said, long waits are unacceptable. In 2020, she admitted there had not been enough preventative and early intervention services before COVID. In 2021, she again said, long waits are always unacceptable. And we've heard the exact same script all over again today. Why does Nicola Sturgeon think it's acceptable to use the same hollow words year after year for eight years while nothing changes, families are left to su suffer and kids are left to pick up the pieces on their own. First Minister. Well, that, that is not the case. Well, 
what we see with mental health treatment is more people coming forward for treatment. Um, more people are being seen for treatment, uh, but we are building services. So Anasawa has put forward uh, what he describes as solutions. He has not said anything today that is not already being done yeah. and happening. So, for example, we are right now recruiting 800 additional mental health workers for a &E departments, GP practices, police station custody suites, prisons. Uh, we're funding 1,000 additional staff uh, to be in community uh, mental health, to build resilience there um, and ensure that every GP practice does have access to a mental health and wellbeing service. We are recruiting 320 additional staff in child and adolescent mental health services. We already see CAM staff at a record uh, high. And so all of this is being done. Uh, more people are coming forward, but we are seeing more people treated. The fact that I mentioned, I think, in my first answer, which Anna Sarwar has, has glossed over, is that in the figures published this week for the most recent quarter, we saw a record high number of children and young people seen uh, by CAMS services. Uh, so progress is being made because of the investments and because of the policies we are introducing. Is there much more work to be done? Absolutely there is, which is why we're going to get on and do it. We'll now move to constituency and general supplementaries, and I call Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, yesterday, Stagecoach announced plans to withdraw the X34 and X36 bus services from Adros into Glasgow via Beath from 17th of July. The loss of this vital link means Beath, a town of 6,000 with no railway station, will be left entirely without a bus service to Glasgow. This out of the blue decision will detrimentally, detrimentally affect the livelihoods of many constituents wholly dependent on the bus for travel to work, hospitals and higher education, or for the facilities and amenities only available in a city, whilst increasing the social isolation of those who visit other parts of Ayrshire. This in a week when North Ayrshire Council's Can new I have a SNP question, please, Mr Admin Gibson? Ministry, sorry. OK, then, I'll go straight to the question. What steps will the First Minister take? to ensure that Stagecoach, which received £88.2 million of taxpayers' money last year, reverses its short-sighted and hugely damaging decision, which also adversely impacts on the Scottish Government's policy of encouraging the use of public transport. First Minister. Uh, well, these are important issues for people in Ayrshire, um, and Kenny Gibson is right to raise them. I am uh, disappointed to hear that Stagecoach is withdrawing the services that Kenny Gibson uh, has just talked about, and I would certainly encourage them to look again at this, of course, uh, Stagecoach is uh, a private company and these are decisions that they are taking on a commercial basis. But we in government, we support the network uh, with almost £100 million through the network support grant, and that includes support to Stagecoach for local bus services. Uh, the Scottish Government also provides funding to local authorities to subsidise socially necessary bus services. So I would encourage Stagecoach and Strathclyde Partnership for Transport to work together to ensure that connectivity is protected in this area for all of the very good reasons that Kenny Gibson outlines. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Bids to be one of the two Scottish free ports are starting to fly in, and more are imminent. These could herald a huge economic boost as we look to recover from the pandemic. However, thanks to the dither and delay of the Scottish Government, we are significantly behind the rest of the UK, especially the likes of Redcar and Thames. Does the First Minister agree that the Freeports project shows what can be achieved when both Scotland's governments work collaboratively? And does she welcome the UK's injection of £52 million to ensure these projects get going in Scotland? First Minister. Well, I, I hate to be the one to break it to Liam Kerr, but had we gone with the UK government timescale on this, we would have had significantly less money to invest in green ports in Scotland. It's only because of the negotiation of this government, of Kate Forbes, in particular, that has ensured uh, that we're getting funding on a par uh, with three ports in England, but also that we are able to have environmental considerations and, crucially, I know this is not something the Tories particularly like, fair work considerations in the green port uh, model in Scotland. Uh, we have come to an agreement with the UK Government uh, after a lot of work uh, on the Scottish Government's part, and, of course, that process is now underway. Carol Malkin. Thank you, presiding officer. The intimidating behaviour witnessed outside the Sandiford Clinic in Glasgow appears to be escalating. On May the 12th, the First Minister offered support to councils who would introduce bylaws to establish buffer zones at abortion clinics. 
On May the 13th, after asking what Glasgow City Council could do in this regard to address these escalating issues, I was told to direct my inquiries to the relevant ministerial working group. First Minister, it appears local and national government are at an impasse. I am aware that long-term planning is underway, but in the short term we need solutions to protect these women. If the Scottish Government believes that the only publicly available legal option is that, just an opinion, will it reiterate in writing its offer of support to councils and do so before the summit, summit later in the summer? First Minister. I will do that. I'll do that very openly today. I'm happy to put that in writing as well, but you know, this is a, a pretty public way of, of doing it. There are legal complexities around this, and it doesn't help anybody for me to pretend that there aren't. So these are complexities that local authorities and indeed uh, national government want to work through. My preference is that we would be able to legislate uh, nationally in order uh, that there is a consistency of approach in this. We know, though, uh, there is a forthcoming Supreme Court case uh, sparked by legislation in Northern Ireland, which will undoubtedly have an impact um, on the legal framework here. But I am very clear on what I want uh, to do. In the meantime, I, I do want to work with local authorities uh, to see uh, what more can be done to protect women accessing sexual health services, including abortion services. I find uh, what is happening outside hospitals and uh, outside the Sandford completely and utterly unacceptable. And let me uh, make that clear. The summit that I have committed to convening uh, will happen this month, um, and that will bring together a range of interests here, including local authorities, including the police, uh, actually, who, of course, operate independently. But there is uh, legislation around antisocial behaviour uh, that also may have an impact or a relevance here. Um, let me just uh, repeat my commitment uh, to find solutions here and to find those solutions as quickly as possible. And lastly, Presiding Officer, repeat my call to those who want to protest against abortion to come and do it outside this Parliament where the laws are made and leave women alone and stop trying to intimidate them. Michelle Thompson. This week, OECD forecasts have shown that the UK is set to have the lowest growth of every G20 economy, apart from sanctioned Russia. This is a direct result of a Tory Brexit and will regrettably have a direct impact on Scotland, given the majority of key economic levers reside with Westminster. Does the FM share my concern about UK government mismanagement and will our independence prospectus help the public understand why it's critical these economic levers are controlled by Scotland for the benefit of Scotland. First Minister. Yes, yes I do and I completely understand why the Tories are shifting quite as uncomfortably in their seats uh, right now because you know, we, knew, we knew last week uh, that largely because of the folly of Brexit, uh, the UK already has the highest rate of inflation of all G7 countries. I think the rate of inflation in the UK is about double the rate of inflation in France right now. And as of this week, we have uh, the quite unbelievable uh, situation, the OECD forecast, uh, suggesting that economic growth in the UK next year will be the lowest in the OECD, with the sole exception of Russia. Uh, which, of course, right now is rightly subjected to global sanctions. Uh, so that is the impact of Brexit. That is the impact for Scotland of being part of the UK. And if the Tories want to argue that as a union dividend, then all I can say is good luck with that. Uh, rather than being subject to Westminster control, we can choose a better future as an independent, outward-looking country with power over the full range of economic levers to build a better Scotland. So the prospectus for an independent Scotland, yes, will set out the deficiencies of being governed by Westminster. And it will point to small independent countries across Europe who, with the powers of independence, are doing so much better than the UK. And that should be the inspiration for Scotland. Stephen Kerr. Uh, President, also yesterday we heard yet again about the impact of the SNP's financial incompetence. It seems appropriate to ask this question following that last one. Public services facing drastic spending cuts in areas including education, local authorities and the police. Does the First Minister agree with the Scottish Police Federation that the spending review has been good for criminals? First Minister. 
No, no, I don't. Of course, this government has supported more police officers, uh, and we have uh, one of the lowest rates of recorded crime in this country since, I think, 1974, a 41% reduction in recorded crime since this government took office. But, you know, I, I'm actually delighted that the Tories keep getting up in this chamber and elsewhere and talking about public spending, because it gives me the opportunity to remind them, to remind the Chamber and to remind everybody across Scotland that the amount of money this Parliament, this Government has to spend is largely decided by Tories at Westminster. That's what's wrong with the situation. This year, thank you, this thank year, you members. This year, a budget that is lower uh, in real terms by more than 5%. Uh, and is uh, projected to continue to be constrained, notwithstanding uh, the rate of inflation hitting 10%. So the sooner this Parliament, this Government is in charge of its own finances and get them out of the hands of Tories at Westminster with independence, the better. Jackie Bailey. Funding for the Scottish Personal Assistance Employers Network has been withdrawn by the SNP Government. This is the organisation that helps disabled people pay for their personal assistance, who in turn provide care and support for disabled people to enable them to retain their independence. The immediate consequence of this closure, which is happening today, is that more than 500 personal assistants will not be getting paid this week. I have seen the emails between the government and the organisation, and I am appalled, frankly, at the lack of understanding by the minister and his officials. No alternative has been suggested, and this crisis for disabled people is entirely the fault of this government. You have the power to do something about it. It is about independence, the independence of disabled people in Scotland. So what urgent action will the First Minister take to halt this impending crisis? First Minister. Uh become aware of uh, this issue today, I am asking uh, Kevin Stewart, uh, the relevant minister, to meet with the organisation as a matter of urgency. Uh, there are uh, a number of complexities here, which I, I won't go into now, uh, but uh, I want to see a solution found, and the best way of uh, moving things forward is uh, to facilitate that discussion as quickly as possible. Question number three, Sue Weber. Your presiding officer. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on work to close the attainment gap. First Minister. Uh, the Scottish Government remains committed to tackling the poverty-related attainment gap, evidence of course by our increased investment in the Scottish Attainment Challenge uh, of £1 billion, up by £250 million from the last parliamentary term. Uh, progress is being made. Uh, we can see that, for example, in the record high proportion of full-time first degree entrants to university coming from the 20% most deprived areas of Scotland in 2020-2021. Uh, there is, however, more to do. The challenge has, of course, been exacerbated by the pandemic, which is why we continue to support head teachers through pupil equity funding uh, and why, of course, we are funding all 32 local authorities to develop strategic approaches, including uh, setting their own aims for progress. Sue Weber. Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you stated in 2015, and I quote, that excellence in education is essential to our prosperity, competitiveness, well-being, and to our overall success as a nation. Despite this laudable ambition, your government's spending review cut the education last week by 5% in real terms. Spending on children and families is set to be slashed in real terms by 15 million. On skills and training, by 23 million and on higher education and student support by 30 million. First Minister, have you completely abandoned your promise to make education your top priority? First Minister. No, as I've... Before I come on to what this government is doing, um, let me just remind the member uh, what the calculation of real terms depends on. It's the rate of inflation. Uh, that determines whether something is increasing uh, or decreasing in real terms. Let me remind her, in real terms this year, the total Scottish Government budget uh, has declined by more than 5% in real terms. The rate of inflation, of course, that in the UK, thanks to the UK Government policy decisions, including Brexit, is the highest of any G7 country, double uh, the rate of inflation in France. So perhaps a bit of self-reflection might not go amiss on the part of the Conservatives. The spending review 
uh, is not a budget. It allocates over the next few years uh, the funding we have available. Do I hope that uh, funding envelope increases? Yes, I do. Uh, but again, unfortunately, uh, that depends on decisions taken by the UK Government. It's not my choice that this Parliament is dependent on Westminster decisions. That's the choice of unionists across this chamber. But let me come back to education. Thank you. Thank education you. budgets have been increasing. Um, and the final point I would make in this context, the most important point, we are increasing the funding for the Scottish Attainment Challenge to £1 billion, up £250 million uh, from the amount we invested in the last parliamentary term. So that's the commitment. That commitment remains and that commitment is strong, notwithstanding the hurdles put in our way by the Tories at Westminster. Willie Rennie. In, in 2016, with a tear in her eye, the First Minister said she wanted all young people to have the same advantages as her. She put her neck on the line for education. Now the word barely passes her lips. She promised to substantially eliminate the attainment gap in a decade. Now our government says it would be top-down and arbitrary to set such a date. We've got the First Minister setting a date and the Education Secretary saying it would be wrong to set a date. The government is all over the place on education. But young people want to know why she has given up on them and closing the attainment gap by 2026. First Minister. Uh, we have it. Let me quote uh, from the manifesto commitment at the 2016 election uh, that the Scottish Government uh, would support the substantial closure of the attainment gap by 2026. I stand uh, by that. That remains uh, the policy and the objective of the government. Um, and of course, uh, we are seeing progress. Um, I'm always very mindful of the fact uh, that I was the first member of my family to go to university. I'm particularly mindful of that when a Liberal Democrat is questioning me because, of course, I benefited from free tuition, something this government continues to protect and something that the Liberal Democrats, of course, uh, have a shameful record on. And that is why, while there is still work to do, I am so proud of the fact that we are meeting our targets in terms of improving the numbers from the most deprived community going to university, something that the Commissioner for Fair Access to University described last week as an unambiguous success. So we'll continue to get on with the job building uh, on the progress. Willie Rennie questions that. That was the independent Commissioner for Fair Access describing our uh, achievements in access to university from young people from the most deprived communities. Question number four, Stephanie Callaghan. Thank you. To ask the First Minister, in light of reported findings from the children's charity Aberlour that over £1 million is owed in school meal debt, whether the Scottish Government will provide an update on its plans to expand universal free school meal provision in order to support families struggling with the cost of living crisis. First Minister. Uh, well, I am aware of the Aberlour report, uh, which indicates that over £1 million in school meal debt is owed uh, across Scotland. While the data in the report is incomplete, and from December last year, I have asked Scottish Government officials uh, to look uh, more deeply into this issue. Uh, Scotland's offer of universal free school meals to, uh, at this stage to all primary one to five pupils and those in special schools is uh, the most extensive universal offer in the entirety of the UK and provides around £400 of support per pupil to families. In addition, we have continued uh, to support eligible families uh, during school holidays um, and we will work with partners and local authorities over uh, the coming months in preparation for the further planned expansion of free school meals. Stephanie Callaghan. I thank the First Minister for her response. It is concerning that, at this time, the rising costs that families of school pupils are being chased for debts by councils. Does the First Minister agree with me that local authorities should write off this debt? First Minister. Well, households are, uh, right across the country are facing um, a totally exacerbated cost of living crisis, uh, which is pushing up food prices. And we know that those in the lowest incomes are hardest hit. Uh, so I am deeply uncomfortable, as any decent person should be, with families being pursued for debt for school meals, especially in the economic climate uh, that exists right now. So I am very sympathetic to calls uh, for this debt to be written off. And as part of what I've asked officials uh, to do is to look at that. 
Um, it should be said that local authorities do usually write off school meal debt for families, but as I've said, I've asked Scottish Government officials to talk with COSLA about what more can be done. Local authorities also have flexibility to offer free school meals to families who don't meet eligibility criteria but are experiencing financial hardship. And I would encourage anyone who thinks they have become eligible for free school meals to apply as soon as possible. Question number five, Miles Briggs. Uh, thank you, President Officer. To ask the First Minister what changes have been made since the 2018 report by the Children and Young People's Commissioner regarding concerns about the restraint of children in schools. First Minister. Working closely with partners, uh, including the Children and Young People's Commissioner, through the Physical Intervention Working Group to develop new human rights-based guidance to address the concerns raised in the report and minimise the use of restraint and seclusion in schools. Um, and I can advise the Chamber that we will consult on draft guidance later this month. Miles Briggs. Um, I thank the First Minister for that answer. Freedom of information requests suggest 3,000 children in the last year have been restrained in schools. Now, without statutory regulation, there's no need for local authorities to report or monitor restraint, no statutory training, even when the restraint involves face-down restraint of young children in schools and care settings. Can I ask the First Minister to review the Government's approach with regards to just guidance being provided? And would the First Minister also agree to meet with myself and families and campaigners uh, to take forward these changes? First Minister. Um, I, I will ask the uh, relevant Minister to meet uh, with the member and uh, with campaigners and, and families. Um, I absolutely am happy to do that. Uh, let me make a, a couple of points which I hope are, are helpful. Firstly, and I, I'm sure this is something all of us agree with, Restraint and seclusion should only ever be used as an absolute last resort to prevent harm uh, and only when in the overall best interest of the child uh, and young person. And I think that's something, as I say, we would all agree with. As I said in my uh, original answer, we are currently preparing to consult on draft guidance. We will do that later this month. However, um, and I hope this is helpful, we are committed to looking further at the options to place that guidance on a statutory basis, uh, particularly if the guidance itself does not have uh, the desired effect, although I, I hope it will make a difference. So we will not rule out uh, legislation and will actively consider the options for that. Question number six, Cocap Stewart. Thank you. To ask the First Minister whether she will provide an update on the Scottish Government's super sponsor scheme for displaced Ukrainians. First Minister. As of today, there have been 12,861 applications for a visa with a Scottish sponsor um, and over 11,500 visas issued. Around 4,200 displaced Ukrainians with a Scottish sponsor have now arrived in the UK. Uh, 2,035 of those have an individual sponsor and 2,236 uh, have the Scottish Government as super sponsor. In partnership with local government and third sector partners, we have established a network of welcome hubs with access to meals, accommodation and support for anyone who arrives here. Uh, they have now triaged more than 2,100 people. A national matching service uh, being delivered by COSLA is working hard to find longer term accommodation using all options, including the generous offers uh, of accommodation that have been made by the public. Uh, this has been a national response developed and delivered at pace and of course we will continue to ensure that all those arriving are treated with compassion and care. Co-Cap Stewart. Uh, thank you, First Minister, but it continues to be the case that local authorities welcoming displaced people through the Ukraine Family Scheme receive no funding at all from the UK Government, and even the £10,500 per person under the Homes for Ukraine is not much, considering all the provisions that need to be put in place to support those who are seeking refuge. Will the First Minister urge the UK Government to urgently put in place appropriate financial support for all local authorities, no matter the scheme someone has arrived through, to ensure that those settling here can have all their needs met? First Minister. Uh, yes, this is an important and a serious issue. Um, and there have been acknowledgements from UK Government Ministers, uh, principally Michael Gove, that these are uh, serious issues. Uh, both Neil Gray and I have repeatedly raised it and will continue to do so in the strongest terms. Uh, the £10,500 per person tariff does not provide adequate funding for local authorities and public services. Uh, this tariff is not even uh, provided to local authorities for people who arrive through the family visa route, and I do not think that is acceptable. Um, our local authorities and public services are supporting people regardless of their visa route. Uh, there is a clear need to provide 
appropriate funding that reflects the unique impact of the various UK government schemes uh, implementation on public services and local communities. Um, this is, of course, a reserve matter, uh, but we take our responsibility seriously and the Scottish Government wants to do as much as we can. So for our part, the Scottish Government has committed £11.2 million to local authorities to support resettlement and integration and the refurbishment of properties. Question number seven, Pauline McNeill. Thank you. To ask the First Minister what steps the Scottish Government will take to ensure that victims of rape and domestic abuse are not re-traumatised as a result of plans to allow them to formally meet those who have harmed them. First Minister. Uh, we recently launched two hubs to support the national rollout of restorative justice services uh, that enable safe, voluntary, uh, facilitated contact between people harmed by crime and those responsible uh, for the harm. But let me stress, uh, it is voluntary and only where the victim of crime uh, wants this to happen. It is important to note that the needs of people harmed are at the heart of this process. Uh, even if they choose to do this, uh, they will set the pace uh, at all stages and can stop the process at any time. Um, I recognise that victims and survivors in very sensitive cases involving sexual harm and coercive control uh, may request access to restorative justice and we are working with partners to design services to respond appropriately to those requests. A trauma-informed and comprehensive risk framework will be created for these cases with the individual needs and safety of the person harmed at the centre. Polly McNeill. I thank the First Minister for that answer and she is quite right to reiterate the words of Sandy Brindley who rightly said that no one should ever feel um, that they have to, to do this or pressurise in any way. But I also believe that we must improve the experiences of the justice system for victims of sexual violence, which disproportionately affects women and girls. And I know the First Minister is very strong on this point. But at the Criminal Justice Committee, we heard from survivors of rape and sexual assault who said that they felt as if they were being treated as the guilty party. And long delays in the current court system means that they are often left in the dark as to what happens in their court cases. Um, I ask the First Minister if she thinks that perhaps more support should be given to those victims, but in, interestingly, legal advice before they go to court. I ask the First Minister if she would consider a proposal or even enter into some dialogue about a means-tested test, means independent legal representation scheme for victims of rape and serious sexual support in the pre-trial period as a way of radically altering the experiences of rape victims and survivors of sexual assault? First Minister. Uh, yes, I will give consideration to that. Obviously, issues around independent legal representation uh, of victims of rape and sexual violence in the criminal justice uh, system um, has been raised in particular contexts in the past, for example, uh, where information uh, about the history uh, of the victim has been requested as part of the court process. So these are important issues. Um, I, I do agree, um, and I think this is simply a statement of fact, sadly, even in our society today, that many survivors of rape and sexual assault uh, are often left feeling under-supported and as if they are somehow the guilty parties. That's partly down to attitudes within society. Right now, there is also an impact there of backlogs in the court system because of the pandemic, which is why we're working so hard uh, to address uh, that. Uh, so anything we can do, uh, we are obviously funding organisations to deliver the equally uh, safe initiatives. Uh, anything we can do to better support uh, those affected by these crimes, uh, I think we have a duty to consider. So I will give consideration to the specific proposal made today. But let me, in terms of the subject matter of the actual question, let me reiterate again the voluntary nature of that. Um, and it's one thing, and this is something um, I've certainly raised within government, it's one thing to say it's voluntary, but we must make sure the process, even in offering people that option, isn't heard by the victims is somehow something that they are expected to do or being pressured to do. So how this is taken forward is really important. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Jackie Bailey. Presiding officer, the First Minister may not be aware that Kevin Stewart is in fact ill and self-isolating with COVID. I'm sure we wish him a speedy recovery. Can she therefore ensure that in his absence, the Cabinet Secretary meets today with the SPEEN network instead? Thank you. Thank you, Ms Bailey. Um, as the member will be aware, that is not a point of order for me. However, the member's point is on the record.